Well, all right. You guys doing okay today? Yeah. yeah? All right. Well, we're going to jump right in. If you have a Bible or, you know, hard copy or digital Bible, you can turn on over to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 and verse 34 is where we're going to be. And so if you're not familiar with your Bible, the Bible's broken up into Old Testament and New Testament. And so Mark is in the New Testament of the Bible. Just look in your table of contents, find Old New Testament, find the New Testament, Mark, flip over to chapter 8, and we're going to be in verse 34 and following. And you, if you have a digital Bible, you can just go down there and type in Mark. If you don't know how to spell Mark, ask a neighbor. And so Mark chapter 8, verse 34 and following. And if you don't have a Bible this morning, you can check it out here on the screen. You guys ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. I mean, you guys are excited. All right, here we go. Then he called the crowd with him, crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel, which means that's just a fancy word to say the good news, will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Verse 37. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, basically saying this is a messed up place that we live in, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Um, so that's pretty heavy. As we jump in this morning, you didn't wake up and go like, all right, I can't wait to hear about how I either follow Jesus or don't. And it's going to be difficult. You didn't wake up and go like, all right, this is exciting. I want to get like the heaviest thing possible. And that's how I want to start my Sunday morning. It's like, man, just make me feel good, Jason, this morning. Just make me go, oh, that's, that's good. All right. I'm happy Jesus loves me. When do we eat? And, and so today, if, if we were going to kind of look at this, and we're in this series, Full Signal, um, I, I would probably just kind of label this, uh, what does it look like for an interruption to happen in your life and mine so that we would actually hear him? Why don't you pray with me? God, I thank you that, that we can follow you, that, that you give us the Bible so we can begin to understand you and your story, not uh, a story about us, but about you. And as we dive into these pages and begin to really kind of walk through with a fine-tooth comb and understand what you have in store for us through your Son. Uh, maybe all the things that we've ever thought about you or we've been told about you that have been, that have been hurtful, that we felt uh, were judgmental, uh, that maybe we heard a, a teacher or a leader or a pastor say things to us or about us that, that, that just stung May today we, we break down some of those things and, and maybe set those to the side to hear you with, with fresh ears, that our, that our heart would be ready for what you have in store. As we look at what does it mean to deny ourselves and follow you, something very counter-cultural in, in how we live today. God, thank you for listening to us. And it's through your Son we pray. Amen. When I think about this, this concept, this idea of denying ourselves, of following God, of saying, I'm going to, all right, everything that I want, I'm going to put to the side and, and I'm going to follow him. I think of the question that's probably running through your mind. It was even running through your mind on your drive-in. It wasn't, what's, what are they going to talk about? Or, man, I wonder if the band's going to sing that song. More than likely what happened, and maybe even in the lobby or after church today, you're going to ask the question, where are we going to eat for lunch? It's the question that happens. You've eaten breakfast. You're like, oh, that was okay. Or maybe you didn't. You're one of those. And all the doctors would say, that's very bad. But at some point you go, hmm, all right, what are we going to eat 
for lunch. And there are many choices that you could have. Maybe you've already planned out, like we talked about yesterday, the model of faith that, or it, last Sunday where we talked about faith as a microwave and we want it really fast, or we talked about faith as a crockpot and it sits and stirs. And maybe, and I don't know how many people posted crockpot pictures to my Facebook page <laughs> this last week. They're like, we're taking that to heart. We're making the stuff in a crockpot. And everybody, it was really cool to watch. But this idea that faith comes quickly or faith simmers over time. And so maybe you guys right now are thinking about the meal and the, the, just the aroma that is filling the house. And when you open the door, you're like, oh my goodness, it's so amazing. And you've walked in and done that. Or maybe you're just like, you know what, Jason, I don't, I'm not ready to cook. I want to go out. And that's usually the dilemma that my wife and I and our, our family have because we're like, man, we woke up, we're here early, we're here for a couple services, and then we get done, we're hanging out with people, and then we're a little tired. So the last thing that we want to do is make a meal. And so we're like, all right. And our girls are always like, where are we going to go to eat for lunch? And that's the dilemma that we have. And if you're anything like us, usually... I ask the question, and since I have a family full of females, the response is usually like, I don't care, which is not true. <laughs> and you're laughing because, and you've probably seen the little 15 second video of Ryan Gosling looking at the girl and said, what do you want? And the heading over top of it is when I ask my girl where she wants to eat. And he's like, what do you want? It's just like, I don't know. He's like, what do you want? And that goes through, it's because it's true. It's like, where do we eat? And what happens is you have choices. You have a choice to either go, we're going to eat healthy and, 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 and watch this figure here, or we're going to eat what feels good. And, and for most of us, we want to eat something that feels good, that, that, is, that is just great. Because if we eat something that feels good, it's not good for us, but it feels good. It's, it's usually if we eat something that is bad for us, feels good and then bad later, but it's just, oh, it's just so good. It's like ice cream. Like you, there's no, like, you're not just eating ice cream going, I'm going to be healthy. No, you eat ice cream because you're like, this is ice cream and here's the fudge and here's the sprinkles and here's the whipped cream and the cherry. Ah, cherry is still kind of a fruit. Well, let's do something else. Like more sprinkles, more fudge and all this stuff. And you do it and you don't wait. I just want a little bite of granola. No, you want to go eat something that's fun. And it's kind of this wrestling with God that you go, God, why is everything that's good for me make me fit? And why is everything that's bad for me make me big? But it tastes so good. And that's the dilemma that we have when we pick our lunch. And so usually the place that I would love to go that I know I shouldn't go is Cracker Barrel. There's something about that when, and, and the staff will know, because every time we go, I get the very same thing. I, right now, if I walked in, I would get country fried steak that is about the size of my face, and just and I would get the sawmill gravy on the side, because I'm trying to watch. You know, and then what I'll get, I'll get mashed potatoes with gravy, smothered, because it's awesome. I'll get macaroni and cheese, because I don't care about my weight. And all these, why? And it's full of carbs, and all these things that make me feel feel amazing. And there's a moment where I go, God, why can't this be just such a spiritual thing? Because this is so good. I'm thankful for this. We even prayed, God, bless this to the nourishment of our bodies. There's nothing nourishing about that meal. You've prayed it. You've prayed it over McDonald's before. You're like, dear Lord, thank you. Just bring this, bless this to the nourishment of our bodies. And he's sitting up there going, are you for real? You're sitting at McDonald's. Like, and we pray this and we pray this. And then it, equally what I want to eat and all these things that aren't good for me is also partnered with my disdain for working out. Like, and so that's really bad. You're like, man, I really want to eat this. It's just so good. And then I don't really want to, like, if you have a conversation and yes, I exercise, but if you go, are you excited about exercising? No. No, no, I'm not. Like, I don't like, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to exercise. No. But if you said, hey, are you ready to go to Cracker Barrel? I'll do a dance. I will be like, <laughs> let's talk about all the ways that Cracker Barrel can fulfill me in this moment. And you said, let's have a conversation about exercising. Oh, that's nowhere near as fun. I, I actually, I would rather just talk about this because this feels good. And this, this is, this is carnal and it's great. And I will just sit back. But if you're anything like me, if you eat one of those meals, and if you get into that moment, and, and this is, and, and ladies, I, I love you guys, but you're the worst at this. You'll go, you'll, all right, I'm on a diet, I'm not going to eat anything, whatever. And you guys will go out together, and someone will offer you, like, hey, you want some french fries? Ooh, I love french fries. You'll start eating all these french fries, they're so good. You'll eat them, and then afterwards, you're like, oh, 
And you'll all lament together. Oh, I can't believe I hate those French fries. I hate French fries. Oh, I'm totally going on a diet again. Like, didn't you just talk about a diet? Oh, and you'll lament, you whatever. And that's what makes you women. And, and so, like, it is, and you do this, and that's no hate, and just what happens. And, this, and we often realize that the things that we, the, all these things that we want to do are like, man, that's probably not good for me, but the things that I need to do, oh, man, like, I, I just don't feel like it. And if you don't walk away with anything else in our journey with God and how this works and these interruptions that happen, I want you to get this, and it'll be here on the screens, is what you really want often isn't realized until you do what you really don't want to do when you really don't want to do it, all right? I know that's wordy, but follow with me here. What you really want often isn't realized until you do what you really don't want to do when you don't want to do it. That happens often in our lives, isn't it? You go, oh wait, I don't really wanna work out today. And, and then you work out and then you go, oh, that felt really good. And then you wanna let everybody know like you, you, you guys do, and I started it when I started running, I'm like, I'm not going to keep posting it anymore. Like every day it's like selfie like, eh, in my race thing and whatever. And you do, like everybody's want to like check me out. Why? Because we just feel good and we want to brag. And I'm like, oh, this feels so good. And you'll get in the mirror and you, I'm sure none of you do this, but me, like you'll work out and all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I could see a difference immediately. <laughs> and whatever, you can't see that. It takes time, whatever, but I'll stand there like, oh yeah. That's good. And you'll even like suck it in a little bit. You're like, oh yeah, that workout was totally good. I also can't breathe right now. <sighs> Whatever. But the, the effects of what happens and what takes place and all of these things, we see that what we don't want to do is the, really the thing that we need to do. And it's usually when we don't want to do it. And so we get to passages like this in Mark and we go, ooh, I, I don't know about this. And we're going to kind of follow up, and I want to key in on this verse. They'll bring it up here on the screen. It's the very first one that we read. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. We're going to pause kind of on the screen. He's talking, this is Jesus talking with the, the Jews at the time, mainly Jews that are around there, and he's explaining to them what does it mean to follow him. What does it mean to, to walk this life out with God? Now, when we hear this, and especially that phrasing, you know, okay, deny myself, all right, I guess like everything that, that necessarily I want to do, like I'll put that to the side. And then we get to this phrasing, take up their cross. Now, if you're at all familiar with God or faith, or you've been around church for a while, usually what you would think of is like, oh, no, no, that scene of Jesus, he's, he's going to the, the crucifixion to die. And so he gets his cross and he walks it out. And, and we think of, oh, we're dying to ourselves. Now, that would fair, be fairly accurate, but I don't think that that's what would be pictured here in this early time. Because as he obviously, since he's talking to them, he's not going, he has not been to the cross yet. And so as they would picture this, they actually wouldn't picture Jesus. They wouldn't have pictured anybody else other than criminals. As they would walk through this and they would see, oh, so he's he calling me to die? No. The verbiage in there says that they would take up their cross. And so this isn't him saying you would go and die on your cross, that you would go and sacrifice yourself on the cross. I said, no, that you would pick it up, that you would carry it. And so they would begin to walk out and go, oh, this is, he's talking about criminals here. And they go, wait a second. You're, you're talking about this, but then you said, follow me. Like, Jesus, do you have a cross? Are you, gonna, are you a criminal? Are you going to do something wrong? Like, what's taking place here? Because he's asking us to follow him. And to the audience that was there during that time, they actually wouldn't have had this thing like, oh, Jesus is going to die. They go, what exactly? And it would have been a little confusing for them. What is he talking about? And to really get a hold of this, we have to actually go a little further along in the chapter of Mark, in the book of Mark, and begin to see exactly what happened. And we get the, the full played out version of the story when it says, picking up our cross and following him. Because interestingly enough, Jesus didn't carry his cross. Now, oftentimes people go like, what do, you, what do you mean? Like it says, Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. So obviously Jesus must have picked up his cross and, and walked through the thing. And 
Well, to a certain extent, it would have been very short distance. That's true. During that time, Roman soldiers, because people would have been very hurt, they were beaten almost to the point of death before they ever went to a cross. And so the, the ability for someone to carry a cross would be extremely difficult. It wouldn't be like one of those things where like, oh, we're just going to whip you a little and then you can carry this large beam because it wouldn't be an entire cross as may, is usually pictured. It would have been just the beam and they would have had the rest set into the ground and everything where they would have had it laying down, ready to hammer it in and then prop it up and do that. And so it would just be a large beam that, that whoever was getting ready to die, criminals, etc., would carry it to eventually their death. And this was called the death walk. People would throw all sorts of things. They would spit on people. They would yell at them. It was not a glamorous thing at all. It was actually one of the worst things that could happen. It was very public and the Roman Empire wanted it to be this way because everything they wanted to do was let them know that if you were going to defy us, here is what's going to happen to you and everyone else will see it. So people would live in fear and not want to defy Rome. And so you see this death walk, and actually Jesus is not the one that even carries his own cross. And so to be able to follow back, and if you have a Bible, you can kind of turn over a few pages and a few chapters to Mark 15. Mark 15, and it's actually verse 21. And when it jumps in, we see this guy named Simon. And as you follow along in that little verse, it says that Simon from Cyrene, he's from Africa, okay? So this guy's African and he's visiting, he's getting into town, and what we find from him is that it's noted that he's a passerby, that it's one of those things that he's not there for Jesus, okay? You know, sorry, Jesus, he is not there for you and the scene that's happening and what's going on. He's actually there, more than likely, he's celebrating the Passover feast. He's there for a short time. He's just there to pay homage, do what he needs to do, probably get some because this was a transient area, a, a port, so people would go in, get what they needed, and then go back home. And so he's visiting, going to Passover, doing all these things, and then he's going to get what he needs, and he's going to go back home and be. And so he is a passerby. He is not there for Jesus. And more than likely, is if maybe if you've seen this story play out, maybe you have, have seen this, maybe if you watch that Bible miniseries, or uh, if you've ever seen some of the other ones like Passion of the Christ, in other words, you see somebody standing in the crowd, waiting and watching as things go by. Actually, by the very verbiage of what transpires there in Mark 15, more than likely he was minding his own business, not even paying attention to what's happening with Jesus. He's just moving on by. And then, as normally would follow, because people couldn't carry their own cross, the Roman guards would pick someone out of the crowd. And so we find this, this man, Simon, is noted that a, a Roman guard has pulled him out and said, Hey, you, carry this cross. What an interruption. All right, think about that for a second. You're busy kind of doing your own thing. You don't even mind, like, you're not even paying attention to what's transpiring. The streets are filled with people. You might have kind of looked, but you keep on walking because you're like, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Most of them had seen a crucifixion before. And so they're moving along, and Simon's moving on his way, and he's yanked out by a, a Roman guard. Or maybe he's, hey, you, you there. And he's like, who, me? Like, hopefully you're like looking around like, please tell me you're looking. It's like when someone asks for prayer in a small group and everyone's like, hey, do you want to do it? And they're like, who, who, me? No, 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 I don't want to do it. And, and so he looks and he's like, hey, you, you, come here. He's like, oh, seriously? And so he, he gets over and says, you carry this cross. Just what an interruption taking place. Like you're busy getting your things, going about your day. And here you find yourself now carrying the very cross of Jesus. Not exactly what he woke up and planned that day. He didn't wake up and go, I can't wait to go into town, get all my things, and then carry the cross of some criminal. And yet here he finds himself holding this beam, and he's walking. And, and it's almost like, and I imagine he, he's kind of going, I, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know what's going on. And he's carrying this cross. Because you may have heard it said that, that someone just, you know, that Simon's the one that jumps in to help him. That's not actually what we see here. He's called out to be able to go and carry this beam along down the road. And he's like, I'm, I'm not here for this guy. I, I just want to go about my business and, and what started out as an interruption in Simon's day ends up being this amazing thing and seeing something extraordinary in the person, the work of Jesus. And he begins hearing God in this story with a full signal. 
And the reason that we would glean this from watching this very instance, if you'll follow and kind of look in that verse, it notes his sons. Now, why in the world his sons aren't there? He, it notes right in there, Simon, who is from Cyrene, and it says the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why in the world, it'd be like, we're, you know, like, hey, my name's Jason. I'm the father of Chloe and Roxy, whatever, but they're not even there. You go, why, why is it, why would God think to put in that passage those two names when it really has no bearing on what transpires? Well, I would contend it does. There's a reason that those names are put in there in that place. And we can see, if, if you take some time to, to open up the New Testament and look, that in, over in the book of Acts, as the early church is starting, and over in Timothy, later on in the New Testament, their names are brought up as early church followers. Now, all of a sudden, you have this guy, Simon, whose life is completely interrupted. And then, later on in the New Testament, we find out that his sons are actually followers of of this, this movement, these Christians, or what during that time was called the way, people who believed in God and followed him. And it's even noted in extra biblical writings that Rufus, his son, ended up being a pastor. And so what was the change that led this family that didn't want to have any interaction with Jesus all of the sudden, now their story is completely changed. Well, I would say that Simon started hearing God with a completely full signal, and it started at the very moment that he was called out by a Roman soldier and asked, hey, you, I know that you don't have a lot going on, but pick up this crossbeam and walk it out. And we start watching this unfold, and I wonder what took place as, as Simon was having interactions with his sons. That he was going, you know what, I'm not looking for this Jesus guy day to day. I'm not like, and none of us do. Like you, didn't, you and I, when we come into this world, we're not immediately going like, all right, I need to find this Jesus guy. I need to follow Jesus. Like we're not bent towards that. Usually what we're bent towards is I want to do my own thing when I want to do it, how I want to do it. And Jesus, that is the last thing on my radar and things that I want to follow. And here we have Simon going, I, I'm not looking for this guy. And then he is drastically interrupted. And you know what? God loves to interrupt our lives. He loves it because those interruptions lead us to a place where we can hear him completely without anything else going on. Think about it. When people come to God and come to faith or walk through the doors of the church, usually it's in total chaos. My life's falling apart. I need a fresh start. I need to, man, things are all this other stuff. And so there, an interruption happens in, in somewhere, a coworker, a friend, a family member, like, you need some Jesus. And so all of a sudden they're like, oh, I'm going to show up. I'm going to look for a church. And we drive by, we see a sign, and then we find ourselves plopped in here. And then we go, man, why? Because life was drastically interrupted. I think that God uses those interruptions to, to ring, to resonate, to sit and go, this is the moment that I want to speak to your life because you need me. And it was that moment that Simon carried that beam and it changed the trajectory not only of him, but his entire family. That's how grace works, is that we're kind of find ourselves over here and we go, I, and people say like, I found Jesus. No, you didn't. You didn't like, it's not where's Waldo. You're not like, oh, all of a sudden looking through me like, I totally found Jesus. Like you didn't, you didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. God, like in this very instance where he finds Simon, Simon could be like later on to his sons, like guys, I found Jesus. No, what he would say is like, God just picks me up and puts me in his story. That, that God had a plan for my life to introduce me to people and places and put me in the very spot where I needed to be interrupted so that my life could be forever changed. That's how grace absolutely works for you and I. And so this idea of like, man, I just need to find Jesus. No, God will, will seek you and I out. And in, in the hardships and in the trials and in the hurt and the pain and all these other things that take place, God is moving and saying, you know what? I have a plan for you. My, my will and the things that are going to be done, I am going to find a place to move in your life. The question is, are you going to realize it? Because what you really want often isn't realized until you do what you really don't want to do when you really don't want to do it. And oftentimes when you and I are trying and seeking through and wading through all this stuff, the last thing we want to do is follow Jesus. 
in our own will and the things that take place. It's kind of like if you've ever played dodgeball. How many of you guys have ever played dodgeball? Remember as a kid? Yeah? Like dodgeball. Some people are like, yeah, I love dodgeball. I was never a fan, mainly because I wore glasses and they always broke. And then I had to go home and tell my mom and dad, like, I broke my glasses. And like, you didn't break your glasses. A kid did. Who was the kid that threw the ball? And walked through this whole thing. But there's something about our journey with God that's much like dodgeball. God's throwing things towards us. Like, I want to impact you with grace. We're like, no way. And we drive. And like, God's like, I want to impact you. I feel like, yeah, maybe tomorrow. And all these things are taking place in our life. And we're seeing the signs flying by us. Your kids are a wreck. I want to change that. Yeah, I want them to change, but I don't know if it's like that. I want to do it my way. And we're dodging and we're ducking God. And God is continually, not in a harmful way, but he's like, I have something for you. I want to give it to you. And we just keep moving instead of wanting to come to a place where we want to do the things that in our heart we really don't want to do. And, and it's when we don't want to do them, but God is saying, I know you don't want to do it. I know this doesn't seem like the right time, but that's exactly what I want to do because I want to let you know that it's my plan, not your plan. That, that it's my story, not your story. Even though it's your life, it's actually the thing that I want you to deny because I want you to follow me. Quit dodging and ducking and moving. And I have a plan for you, something greater for you. Not, not a perfect life because you're gonna have ups and downs and this world is hard and there's evil things that happen and life's gonna be tough. But I have a plan for you if you would just listen to the interruption. Because I'm, I'm, I'm moving through all that stuff that you consider a wreck to be able to tell you you are loved, you are cherished, and there is something greater. Because he's calling each of us to be a light. Each and every one of us is called in our lives to be a light. And this is a weird concept for us. We, we take for granted the fact that we can turn on a light switch and it'll come on. But the beauty is, and, and you guys don't know this, but when you come in to this room, and you've probably done this in your own home, if you don't turn on a light and you walk into a room like, I just need to grab something real quick to do it, you end up almost killing yourself. You do. You trip over stuff. Somebody's moved something. And it's, it's absolutely awful. But like when we come in here in the, during the week, in the mornings, especially when the blinds are down and everything, you try to go through here and make that little S turn in there. Oh yeah. You take your life in your own hands. Like it is so dark with no lights and everything else. And then every once in a while, somebody doesn't set the switch. So that little light switch right there at the door can come on. You're like, Oh, I have to navigate through here. I need to call my family first because there's no chance I'm going to make it through this little turn because you stumble over something. So many times I've walked through there and fallen and God calls you and I to go, hey, don't go through the darkness and all this stuff. Actually, I want you to be a light into other people's lives so that you can shine something that's greater. And we go, oh, I don't really know. <laughs> like, I'm going to dodge that. And God's going, I, I have something better for you, but I actually need you to carry it along with you. I, I don't, I don't want to be a light. I'll let other people, that's, that's for like the pastor to do. That's for like the other leaders to do. That's for those, those guys, I think they call them elders, like it's their job. Like those people in children's ministry that are teaching the kids, like they can be a light, but God, not me. Like there's no way my life can be a light to other people. But I wonder if we would accept it more and not dodge it if we knew what darkness felt like. You see, for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, often what I begin to see as we try to listen to him with a full signal is I think people forget what it's like once they follow Jesus for a while, what it's like to live without him, what it's like to live in darkness. There's this uh, blind uh, individual that catalogs his life online. He blogs through a Braille keyboard and talks about some of the things that have happened and, and recounting the fact that he used to have eyesight for a short time in the beginning of his life and what it's like to remember being with sight. And, and maybe for a moment what you and I need to understand is what it's like to live in darkness so we can be reminded. And maybe you're in darkness today and you go, I don't really feel like I'm in darkness. I feel like life's going okay. I feel like life's moving all right. I don't need that whole Jesus guy in my life, this whole God thing. I'm not really there. And, and I would say, um, 
you've, you've been dodging, and I could say it because my own life and the lives of other people I've seen, you've been dodging something that God wants to do in your life, and you really think you could do it on your own, but the problem is you're going to get hit with something in life that's going to be really difficult, and God's going to want to use it as an interruption. And you're going to go, oh, I, I, I'm not going to listen. But there's those of us who are called to be a light, and we go, I, I've just forgotten, and, and I don't really know, and so I haven't shared love with other people. I haven't invited anyone to be a part of community. And so maybe hearing from the story of, of one who lives in darkness helps remind us of what it means to, to be in the light and share it with others. I don't normally ask everybody to, to do something, but, but I, I'd ask you to close your eyes for a second. And we're going to actually make the room nice and dark, so don't be afraid. Don't grab your wallet. Nobody's going to take it. So they're going to bring the lights down and Let's listen to that very man who's cataloged his, his life living in darkness. It's black when I get up. It's dawn outside, but I can't see a thing. One of the strangest things is waking up from a dream. When I dream, I don't know I'm blind. I can still see. But then morning comes, and the black seeps in. My reality used to be filled with sight, but now those are my dreams. And my sleep was once without light, but now that is my waking life. The world, I know it's out there, but I don't feel a part of it. It's like I'm a ghost, like the world no longer exists, or that I'm dead, gone, or perhaps some kind of spirit stuck in a parallel universe. I don't want to get out of bed. Not much can happen to me there. There are no new images coming to life for me now. All of the ones I have are from before the accident. I suppose they get further and further out of date, but they're all I've got now. I have nothing new to see. All of my experiences now are black. Just the sensation of feeling my way around the dark of people's voices. I have no idea what they look like, so I make up their faces in my head. I think a lot more about the past than I ever did. When I visit my memories, I can see pictures in my mind. The images are lighter now. It's daylight in my dreams. I have to keep dreaming, or things like colors, I tend to forget them. And stories, I need them so I can imagine new things. I need books to visualize new places. They make me feel alive again. That's what we all need. Creators, dreamers, and storytellers to help us find our way forward, to keep us from living in the past. We need you. Tell us your stories. Go after your dreams. Bring your creations to life. You have to lead us out of the dark. How many of us will accept that interruption? It's not always pretty and it's not always easy. 
But for some of us, our life is in darkness and all we're hoping for is a light. Then there's other of us who have, who have accepted Christ and are called to be a light. And my prayer for you and I is that we will accept the interruption that will be the one like Simon to pick up that beam. And the beauty is Simon didn't die on the cross. While he carried it, it was Jesus was the one who paid the price. There's no more death and condemnation for those who follow Jesus. While that existence in our lives are hard, he's the one who pays the price and we're the ones who are set free. And that is good news for you and I. And in a moment, we celebrate that good news of moving from darkness to light and taking communion. And my prayer for you and for me is that we'll accept the interruption and watch the amazing thing that only God can do. Let's pray.